Hi, I'm Dan Sanguinetti. And I'm Russell Lee. And you're listening to the Christmas episode of Film Rhapsody. When I think of my Christmas experience, the first thing that normally comes to mind was when I was a young boy, playing a shepherd in my primary school's nativity play. Now, I understand that Christmas should be a time of joy, good feelings and cheer. And yes, despite that, I should warn you that I'm about to tell a story that involves a little bit of casual racism and bullying. Though, as all good stories with conflict tend to go, the resolution, perhaps, has led me to where I am today. So please bear with me as I travel to a Christmas past. Playing shepherd number two on the school stage was billed as the grade three role of a lifetime. My teachers told me I would have several lines and I would be able to make my mum proud when she came to watch. I acknowledged the role sounded crucial. There were, after all, only three shepherds that visited baby Jesus and they wanted me to be one of those three. But what I felt disappointed about at that moment was they did not want me to play Joseph, husband to Mary, one of the lead roles in the play. I was not offered the role of King Herod who orders the death of all the babies to protect his monarchy. Or I wasn't asked to play one of the Roman centurions who got to carry a sword and make stabby motions during the play. Nor was I offered one of the three wise men who traveled long and far to visit baby Jesus. Their teachers wanted me to be a shepherd, a farmer, and they wanted me to wear a tea towel on my head. I remember protesting about putting that tea towel on. It will help make you look like a shepherd from the Middle East, I remember being told. I must have been adversely aware as a child that, firstly, acting and dressing up wasn't ever going to be my thing, but that despite being of Italian heritage, my darker complexion meant I was going to be typecast into roles. The other two shepherds were to be played by some of the more ethnically diverse students as well. But I was also a fairly obedient child who listened to his elders, particularly his teachers. And so I put on the tea towel that I'd taken from the bottom kitchen drawer at home and with feelings of regret and frustration, I tied it to my head. That regret was brought to a boil, when, without fail, moments later, another seven-year-old called me a towelhead. I spent most of my school years growing up in England. We lived in a medium-sized town outside of London. It was quite a nice town, busy, a lot of heritage and history, but one that had grown with the times, constantly being renewed, renovated, and modernised. I was also a nervous kid. The regular anxious feelings I experienced today existed as far back as then. There was some cultural diversity in our community, but not too much to help me blend in, so to speak. So without realising why, perhaps at the time, I sometimes always felt segregated and isolated. So again, without really understanding, putting a towel on my head seemed counterproductive. Well, the night of the performance came, about a week before Christmas, and on one of the final days of the school term. I was the last of Shepard to put his costume on, the tartan pattern tea towel used previously to dry up the dishes at home. I remember stating strongly how I didn't want it to fall off before the play started, so I needed to wait before actually putting it on. But eventually the time came and the teachers led all the children into the school hall and onto the stage for us to sing our opening Christmas number, Little Donkey. The hall was full, parents applauded loudly, and the kids began to sing. But I didn't. I felt stupid. I tried to hide behind another kid, sort of mumbling the words in case anyone caught me not singing properly. But in doing so, that's where I caught her face. My mum. She was sitting in the crowd just as it was promised to me. She saw I'd seen her and she waved. And because I'll always be my mother's son, I waved back. I was that kid, waving to his mum during the school Christmas play. But it's funny how certain things in life motivate you to embrace what's in front of you. I began singing with all my heart, loud and proud, just for my mum. When she saw me sing, she smiled. And when it was time to form my lines as I visited baby Jesus in that stable, I gave the performance of my lifetime. My mum has always been a creative inspiration of my strength. She's always encouraged me to follow my creative passions and has been waiting and watching from the stands to see my success. 
And so, when she listens to this episode, because I'm totally going to make her, a very merry, happy Christmas, Mum. And to all mums, Merry Christmas. I've never heard that song before in my entire life. Yeah, it was a song that we sung quite regularly in England. It must be an English thing. I assumed that everyone knew this song. This was like central to my childhood. Hmm. But yeah. Anyway, Russell, welcome. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I thought it would be a little just to walk down memory lane a bit and mm-hmm. talk a bit about what Christmas means to me and how it has always been a quite a happy period in my life. So in keeping with that theme, tell us about today's episode, Russell. Today's episode is our favourite top five Christmas movies. Didn't we do this at Halloween? Yes, we did. So we're not doing anything original? No, not at all. Well, lacking that, we're not doing anything original. Let's, uh, let's kick it off then. Yay! Number five. Hi. The costume is pretty. Oh, it's not a costume. I'm an elf. Oh. Well, technically I'm a human, but I was raised by elves. New Line Cinema presents the story of one elf who's coming home for Christmas. Boy. Can't wait to see my dad. We're, we're going to go ice skating and eat sugar plums. <laughs> Sorry. Now. I think someone sent you a Christmas gram. Dad! We should call security. Good idea. I like to whisper, too. Buddy's experiencing a world he never knew existed. Buddy's your son. What am I going to do? He, he's certifiably insane. <laughs> Discovering what it takes to fit in. Son of a nutcracker. So, new or number five is the Will Ferrell movie, Elf. It's kind of interesting because I'm not a big Will Ferrell f- fan, but I really do like this film. It's, it's, it's kind of, um, it's charming, you know. It, it's sweet and charming and it's not overly sentimental or cheesy. And it also shows me as a writer that with a good script and a good story, you can overcome the fact that your lead cast member is really freaking annoying. So what, what is it that grades you wrong with Will Ferrell? I mean, I think he's one of the greatest comedians of all time. I, I mean, I wouldn't put him on the top of my list, mm-hmm. but well, what is it? Like, come on, Anchorman. I don't know what it is. It's like... I love the eighties SNL Ron cast Burgundy. members. The, 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 oh, God, I hate that movie so much. Oh. I know it, it's, I just have this massive disconnect with nineties Saturday Night Live castmates. Yeah, like whether it's Will Ferrell, Adam Sandler, <laughs> David Spade, very few get um get a laugh out of me. But I, I, like I said I do like this movie. It's charming. So as a Christmas movie, uh-huh. um, what are the things that, obviously, apart from it's set at Christmas yeah. and involves very Christmassy things like Santa and Elf. So how does Elf tell its story? Well, it's all about Christmas spirit, really. You know, Will Ferrell is full of the Christmas spirit when the movie starts. And of course, he has his crisis of faith towards the end and he rebounds, as you do. Um, but I, I think more than Will Ferrell, it, it's about his dad. You know, his dad is this um, corporate seller. He's this grouch. He's, he's a, he's a Scrooge. Father. Yeah, exactly. And so, in, interestingly, it's a, it's probably something that we'll find from all our films and our list that there's always a character at Christmas who is ruining, ruining the Christmas cheer. Because, and you'll find the movies on our list will actually abide to this, this thought process. Yes, there is a... A commercial element of Christmas. Mm-hmm. But when it comes down to it, what Christmas means is family. That and is it's true. not family, not necessarily the family you would expect. That's why I love Elf. So now, what's your number five? I've been down here too long. This sounds somewhat it's negative. To ascend from the sewers of Gotham. A new villain emerges. You didn't invite me, so I crashed. Um, Daniel, I don't think this is a Christmas movie. The perfect enemy. Just wait. Yeah. <laughs> and 
That reminds me of Christmas. Who can save this city is a creature of the night. Is it Santa Claus? Yes. Batman Returns. The ultimate not Christmas movie. But it is a Christmas movie. Oh. Uh, when was the last time you saw Batman Returns? When the DVDs came out. And what was the first scene? A riot. Yeah. That sounds Christmas. Christmas what, what, are they do- what are they doing? Killing people. No, no. What are they? Gotham? With the Christmas spirit. There you go. There you go. (laughs) Yeah. Batman Returns embodies everything that you would expect from a Christmas movie. Snow. Yes, there is snow in it. Christmas trees. There is Christmas trees Christmas presents. There are Christmas presents. Mutant penguins. And there are mutant penguins. So when I was growing up in England, uh, they had a very different rating system. And so... um, my interest in Batman couldn't be fully fulfilled. But considering that the biggest problem was that Batman Returns was such a violent film. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's probably one of the reasons why Batman Forever was really toned down to more of a kid's movie because oh, yeah. the fact is, is someone like me couldn't watch Batman Returns at that age. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was a little bit later in life when I finally got around to watching um, Batman Returns. And um, it didn't even register as a Christmas movie. It isn't until I kind of became a filmmaker and and someone who um, really appreciated film um, did I begin to realize that it what, what Tim Burton was trying to do with the story was actually um, really sort of capture part of the Christmas spirit that goes into Christmas movies um, and very specifically, I mean, you've got the the, the Penguin who's searching for his family and, you know, he wants a, a chance for, you know, except part of his storyline is him looking like he's actually sort of not going to be a villain in this story, which really sits well as for the character of the Penguin. So there's a, there's a crucial scene that, will, that actually mimics what King Herod does. They, and it's not a well-known part of the, the, the nativity story. And that's when once baby Jesus is born, his mother and, and father take him to a cave. A bat cave? Well, maybe there were bats in there. So... Oh, my God. Jesus is Batman. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, uh, doing a Christmas-themed episode was the worst idea to do it with Russell. Oh, my dear. Anyway, so I'm trying to teach you something here. <laughs> Please. So it, these are just stories. They're not real. Just like Batman's not real. Anyway, you so... Take that back. To hide from King Herod's soldiers who are killing all the firstborns. So Mary and Joseph go inside a cave and they um, hide from, from the soldiers. The story goes, a spider saw this baby and knew it was Jesus. And so it weaved a web across the front of the cave. And when the soldiers came walking by... They looked at the cave and went, there must be no one inside because the web is perfectly complete and that no one's broken it and therefore no one must have entered the cave. And so the soldiers kept going and did not disturb the hiding Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. So, so when the penguin takes all the newborn children, uh-huh. Batman turns up and saves them, just like the spider. Number four. To be jolly, la 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 After vacationing across America and throughout Europe, take it, Russ. This holiday season, the Griswolds are going to play it safe. Clark, we're stuck under a truck. Oops. They're staying at home. I give you the Griswold family Christmas tree. Hope you're not getting sap all over your sweater, Clark. All Clark wants is a quiet, old-fashioned Christmas. Sorry. Got a little knot here. You can work on that. What he's going to get is the gift that keeps on living. Merry Christmas. His family. We didn't come to impose. (laughs) Oh, hell, there's plenty of room. Do you sleep with your brother? Do you know how sick and twisted that is, Mom? Well, I'm sleeping with your father. Have you got a kiss for me? <laughs> eh, you better take a rain check on that, Art. He's got a lip fungus they ain't identified yet. But no. So my number four is National Lampoon's cut. Christmas Vacation. So why do I love this? This is kind of the opposite reason for Elf. 
Like Elf is a movie that I enjoy despite who's in it. This is a movie I love because of the Griswolds. I grew up with these um, National Lampoon vacation movies, and this is hands down my favorite. It's, it's something that's always played at Christmas. I'm sure it's going to be on TV next week. For me, this is total 80s SNL at its best. You know, Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, these guys who went on to become massive stars from SNL. This is why we love them. So yeah, this is, this is a big part of the Christmas season for me. That's kind of why I love it. So just based on your previous uh, film where you said you quite like Elf, but um, you don't like many of the 90s SNL stars, mm -hmm. sort of saying that you've got a bit more affection for the 80s SNL stars. Totally. What do you think is the big difference? I don't know. I, th I think maybe in the, in the 80s, maybe it had a bit of a sarcastic bend to some of the young comedians. They all ha they're all sort of these cocky guys. I don't really know why the disconnection, you know, that, that it's just the eighties guys seem to be more fun, seem to have more personality. You know, you watch an Adam Sandler movie and it's pretty much playing the same character in every movie. I, I could probably agree with that. I'm I'm not a big Adam Sandler fan. Mm. Um his comedy is very Yeah. Um, I, I do that meh. that said I do have some Adam Sandler movies I really like, but The most Water of them Boy is probably one of my favourite Adam Sandler. Um and um Big Daddy, yeah, Big Daddy, yeah, Big Daddy was probably one of his better ones. Yeah, it's, it's it was the kid that made that movie. Um, but probably his best movie is a Christmas movie. And oh, the um, Eight Crazy Nights, the cartoon, Eight mm. Crazy Nights of Hanukkah. Um, mm. that that probably is one of his funniest. I mean, there there is still a few of those little like Adam Sandler poop jokes that you just like, Ugh. but as a Christmas yeah. movie. Uh, it just captured the music, the the feelings, the 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 crisis moment of you know Christmas is all over, and it, it is probably one of the only Adam Sandler movies that I would credit liking because of Adam Sandler. Mm. When a lot of the other Adam Sandler movies is because of other characters being memorable or interesting or funny, um, Eight Crazy Nights. Um, yeah, I mean, it, that, that film would probably be in my top 10, but it's not in my top five. So what is your number four? My number four is. Hello girls. Caitlin, come help me in the kitchen. Hurry up. Cause I forget where it is. That's her mom. She's got amnesia. <laughs> what if you couldn't remember your real name, your first kiss? Or your last goodbye. I don't remember. Honey, you have a, an ETA on that carrot? Stow it. And then suddenly... I used to do this! I'm a chef! Yahoo! Without warning... Give me something else! Celery! Scallions! <laughs> all your memories... My name's Charlie. I'm coming back. ...came flooding back to you. In Charlie? All the time. One bullet at a time. I got movement on Samantha Kane. You're good. I may have a lead on someone. I may still have some of her stuff. <gasps> this man, he's gonna help me find some things out. So we'll be safe. Your full name is Charlene Elizabeth Baltimore. This could be trouble. My name is Samantha Kane. No, 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 forget all that. I'm in the PTA. Then quit. You're an assassin working for the United States government. We have 24 hours. We find her and we kill her. So... Your number five film was about a superhero. Your number four Christmas film it's is about, about an assassin. Yes, but it's not a Christmas... Well, it's not a filmmaker's Christmas list without a Shane Black movie on that list. Well, that is true, yeah. Um, no, and obviously not directed by Shane Black. Uh, a Long Kiss Goodnight, directed by... Rennie Harlan. Rennie Harlan. Love um, Rennie Harlan. And uh, starring his wife, Gina Davis. Most filmmakers tend to always put a Shane Black movie in their list when they're talking about Christmas because Shane Black writes. So what about this movie do you, you dig? All Christmas movies need to have a sense of family. I think without that as, as the central core of um, a Christmas film, you don't tend to then have much of a scaffold to work behind because that's what it means. And I mean, you have to look at also from a perspective of the American experience of Christmas. It's very different to Australia. Um, Australian Christmases tend to be more about barbecue and beach and 
sun um, rather than the chill and cold of a Christmas winter um, where you've got to stay close to your family and huddled because it's cold and we'll get there eventually um, with climate climate change. change, Yeah. Climate change destroying. Um, Well, the other way seems to be, I think we're going to burn. I think, you know, it's going to be a devil's Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. And so with the long kiss, good night, it does very well to set. And as that trailer tends to like, as that trailer um, gives off, it feels like it's just another sort of romantic Christmas story. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Wife with uh, memory problems, trying to remember who she was and all that sort of thing. And rather than sort of being she was like something pleasant, yeah, like, like you know, a cook or as she suggests, or um, she was just somebody who forgot her family at Christmas. Um, she's actually a hardcore sexy assassin. Does she have two families or just one? No, 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 she actually doesn't. So the whole reason why she got out of the assassin world, spoilers, is because she's pregnant. Oh my God, this is Kill Bill. It is very Kill Bill. That's mm. very interesting. Yeah, there's a bit of bit of Kill Bill in that. For me, it's just it's a nice twist on it. And I mean, even though the whole thing is a dark, violent, noir story, especially when you've got Samuel L. Jackson's detective character coming in, but his story even is is that he hasn't seen his family for Christmas. And so in the end, what everyone wants is to be around their family, spend time with the people that they care about. Um, it's just that this has got massive explosions and gunfights. Sounds like Christmas, man. Number three. Seven o'clock. Psycho sees Santa's workshop. And only Lee Majors can stop them. In the night, the reindeer die. Be here. You can't show that commercial. That thing looked like the, the Manson family Christmas special. I think I'm way off base. Yes, looks like a Shane Black well, movie. You're <laughs> off base, sir. Frank Cross is more than the youngest network president in television history. Call security. Have them change his locks and toss him out of the building. Oh, he's fired? It's Christmas. Thank you. Call the county. Stop his bonus. Watch out. Ah! He's a thoughtful boss. Thanks, boys. Get the nurse. A generous brother. What did he give you last year? Uh, I don't remember. A shower curtain. Did you hear him? I think you dropped something here. And a true humanitarian. I can't get the antlers glued onto this little guy. We've tried crazy glue. Have you tried staples? But his life is about to change. That was a good one. You are going to be visited by three ghosts tomorrow at noon. God, tomorrow's bad for me, Lou. As a matter of fact, the whole rest of the week is a washout. Anyone who thinks he hates Christmas is wrong. That's right, Russell. Everyone who thinks they hate Christmas is wrong. I don't hate Christmas. Oh, well, tell me about Scrooge then. What can I, what can I say? You know, gro- growing up, there was always a, a Scrooge or a Christmas Carol movie on. I can't remember if it was the, the movie with Albert Finney or not, but there was always one on um, every Christmas. Somewhere along the line, we stopped seeing those movies on TV, and this one sort of became part of the Christmas tradition. What I love about this movie is that it both honors the original story and finds a way to update it, it turns it into something fresh, original, and plus, you can't not love the fact that it both parodies and goes meta on it. It's just so much fun. I must admit, Scrooge is a very interesting take on the classic Christmas Carol story. It's dark, but it should be because you know, Scrooge isn't a very friendly character. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, like it's the most done story. Like, if you were to do a Christmas Carol type story, it's going to be that. It's right up there with Dracula, the amount of version. Yeah, that's there. right. That's right. It, 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 but it, again, because it really does, again, revert to that feeling of what it means to care about the people around you, what mm-hmm. it means to have family. And, and it re- again refers to the, um, I guess, it, you know, if you look past the commercial ideals that Christmas has become. Where you can easily take your family for granted. That's right. It really does come back to is is generosity, goodwill. Connecting with loved ones and sharing the moment. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, and so, cocaine. And cocaine. And so speaking of king, cocaine, I mean, it fits in really nicely with my number three, Jesus. which is exactly the same story. Coming soon on video cassette, Walt Disney Pictures presents a Jim Henson production of a classic Christmas tale. Ah, humbug. He's the world's greediest man. It's Ebenezer Scrooge. Until the magical night he meets someone extraordinary. Hello. 
The Muppet Christmas Carol. Wait a minute, 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 wait a minute. Yeah. Are you saying that Kermit the Frog is on cocaine? Oh my god, is this why he's having a affair with a pig? Oh my god, it makes so much sense. Yeah, I think think Russell's just worked out the Muppets. At least at least where the Muppets came from in the first place. The Muppet Christmas Carol is my number three film in this countdown. Christmas is not complete without the voice of Kermit the Frog. And even better when you've got Michael Bloody Kane being a Scrooge. How the hell did a pig give birth, birth to frogs? The Muppet Christmas Carol, the songs that make up that film, bring so much joy to me. And this, is not, this film is not a uh, childhood memory thing. All right. I saw this movie when I was younger. Sure. It wasn't until I was a grown adult that I really, truly appreciated what the Muppets does, what the Muppets do to, I guess, my, my, my mood, my, my Christmas spirit. Oh, my God. Did someone eat, like, Robin's leg off? Is that why he's playing Tiny Tim? Oh, my God. Oh God. I wish I never got Disney Plus in the first place. Oh, my God. It's horrible. What I think the standout characters are in this is uh, Gonzo and Rizzo. Um, they, they don't have major parts, but they seem to come along for the journey in characters. I think they even self acknowledge that don't exist in the Christmas Carol story, which um, I think gets the first big laugh for me out of it. But, you know, for what the Muppets do in general, like beyond the Christmas um, realm of, the, of particularly this list, the Muppets are something that I go to when I am feeling awful. You know, when I'm really struggling with, with life and things and the struggles that come with, with you know, running a business, you know, f- fighting to, to, you know, make it a living, to, to try and live towards my dreams. Um, I find that when I go to the Muppets, it gives me a sense of peace. And, and that's what the Muppets Christmas movie does for me at Christmas. When I put this on, and, and I will be putting this on, in the lead up to Christmas, I, out of out of my five movies, this will be the first one that I will play to get me into the Christmas spirit. As soon as we close up office at Sanguine Media, number two, the prophecy has come to pass that there would come to us a chosen one, and that he himself would be an artist and a skilled maker of toys. From this day on. Now and forever, you will bring our gifts to all the children in all the world. This is your legacy and your gift, as is the gift of flight. It's them! <laughs> Every year, the magic happens again. Merry Christmas! It certainly should be. <laughs> Until now. What are you? I'm an elf. An elf? Yes. You mean, like, a fairy? I mean, I'm talking modern methods of production here. I'm talking assembly line. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Hold no, on. Someone... What? Was that Dudley Moore? Yeah. Is this Santa Claus? Yeah, it is. Santa Claus, the movie. Oh, my God. Woo! This is not, why is this not on my list? This is, like, the most. you're the Scrooge. This is, like, the most ultimate Christmas movie. Yeah, that's right, it is. And had John, John Lithgow in there. Uh-huh. I don't think I've seen this movie since. And, I, and, and. Christmas. Who? Uh, there's, there's a sequel? No, no, no. no. He, he invents a new holiday in March. Christmas. Oh. Two. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, I was just saying, it, I don't think I've seen this movie in 30 years. Sounds about right. 25 yeah. years, maybe. Now he's dead inside. Well... This Christmas... Dudley Moore as an elf. Well, see, living in England, this movie would play all the time. In Australia, you don't watch TV at Christmas. You're outside playing cricket. Well, I don't play cricket. I'm um, all, yeah. What do I do at Christmas? No, I'm, I'm, I'm building Lego, let's be honest. Or playing, or playing PlayStation 4. Well, well, but I don't, well, wa- I don't watch Christmas movies. Uh, not, not in Australia, but in England, we used to watch them all the time. Mm. Anyway. Anyway, um, this was one of the first films I ever saw in the cinema. I was about seven years old. Um, some family friends took me out to the Monica Cinema for the first time. I think it had just opened. And this is the film I saw. You know, it's, it's a bit sentimental, which I can take or leave. 
but it's just, just so damn inventive. Hands down, David Huddleston is one of my favorite cinematic Santa Clauses. He's just so warm and kind as a big guy. But there's all this sense of realism to him that a lot of movies like the Santa Claus and Fred Claus keep trying to pull off, but they just can't seem to do it. And then, of course, on top of that, you've got Sir Dudley Moore. Uh, he was just f- so much fun as one of the elves. And, of course, John Lithgow steals the show, man. He's just hands down one of the most over-the-top villains in all of cinema. And it's, it's Santa Claus movie, man. I just love this movie so much. I'll have to admit, between John Lithgow's greatest villain performances, it's between this movie, Cliffhanger, The Avengers of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. I can't even remember his villain in that. Oh, he was great in it. Oh. Plays some, a crazy alien. Like, it almost feels like he's going to about to rip his skin off and reveal his alien interior, but never quite gets there. Not into the third act. A bit, bit like the Men, Men in Black. Um character that rips his face he's got like well, when we're talking about menacing we're really talking about the many black villains yeah i know but i'm just saying john lithgow is great in it mm-hmm. um but yes out of the those three movies it's quite even i love cliffhanger rennie harlan again um <laughs> we're really gonna do a really harlan marathon yeah here. or something like that but uh yeah santa claus so basically in short i think this is a big part of why i grew up loving storytelling because it's just, it, it takes the idea of Santa Claus and just makes it so inventive. It's practically Santa Claus as a Lord of the Rings movie meets 80s suburban stuff with, of course, you know, your, your happy little homeless kid and the, mm. the nice little girl. And oh my God, John Lithgow is her evil uncle. Perfect movie. Love it. What's your number two? It's against the law to commit suicide around here. Yeah, it's against the law where I come from, too. Where do you come from? Heaven. What did what, you say just a minute ago? Why do you want to save me? Was it too much to have them work and pay and live and die in a couple of decent rooms and a bath? Anyway, my father didn't think so. This town needs this measly one-horse institution, if only to have some place where people can come without crawling to Potter. I'm leaving right now. I'm going to school. This is my last chance. But they'll vote with Potter otherwise. You can't laugh off this Bailey Park anymore. Bailey family's been a boil on my neck long enough. Do you realize what this means? It means bankruptcy and scandal and prison. That's what it means. I'm worth more dead than alive. Why don't you go to the riffraff you love so much and ask them? I suppose it'd been better if I'd never been born at all. All right. You've got your wish. You've never been born. You've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like without you. I think we should probably preface this by saying that we of course have watched this actual trail on youtube and i think we might even put the link to it in the uh, description this of course once below what the movie is this isn't of course the original trailer for the movie but it's like a uh, a re-release trailer and we just thought it was such an awesome awesome trailer that didn't spoil too much but actually made me for the first time in my entire life want to see this movie yeah it's it's it actually captured um like the whoever made this trailer did a fantastic job hmm. um, because it captures everything that makes it's a wonderful life, a beautiful, beautiful film. Like yeah, it's just, such um, an awesome trailer. And and yes, okay, let's again, let's fall into the cliches of yeah, all right, it's a Christmas movie. It's the greatest Christmas movie ever made. But you know, and and, and as everyone who knows the history of it's a wonderful life knows that it was accidentally the greatest Christmas movie they ever made because when the filmmakers forgot to renew the copyright, mm-hmm. um, it the went te- to public domain. Th- yeah. It went to public domain and people, the TV station said, we need a cheap free Christmas movie to put on, to fill our Christmas um, uh, TV guides. And they picked this free movie called it's a one of life. And they played it every single Christmas for years. And so people just connect Christmas to it's a wonderful life. 
No, I haven't actually seen this movie. I, I, I know. And we discussed this before we started recording. Mm. I was a little bit shocked, but I completely understand. And I have to admit too, it took a long time for me to watch it. Now, my connection to It's a Wonderful Life actually comes from another British property from Christmas. Doctor um, Who? Oh, not quite Doctor Who, but close. EastEnders? No, Red Dwarf. So Red Dwarf's Christmas special actually parodied It's a Wonderful Life. And the character of Dave Lister um, found a lot of solace in that story. Because, again, it kind of follows that similar uh, Christmas Carol mold. It's about somebody who sees a world that exists without them so that they get understanding of where they are in life and they understand so they it's a way of reflecting back on sounds themselves almost, sounds almost like my life sometimes yeah like the, the i mean the, what what the christmas carol story does is that it takes a character who is just so disconnected from humanity that's right and they find they have to learn about themselves what would life be if they weren't part of the world and that's what a wonderful life does um so this is kind of like a Christmas Carol, it is. It's again another iteration of the Christmas Carol. It's it's very much connected to to the story of Christmas Carol because it involves a, an angel or a ghost, essentially giving a insight into a world where he was not there. I'm not surprised that you haven't seen this because it's a movie that doesn't tend to get viewed that often by people who don't know anything about it. If you've not heard about it, It's a Wonderful Life, you've, I mean, you may have heard of it, but you've not experienced it. If you've never watched it and you've been like, eh, I'm not into that, like I don't want to follow the crowd because everyone says it's the greatest movie, greatest Christmas movie of all time. Big to differ. Well, it's number two on my list, so obviously I don't think that. But uh-huh. um, the, the fact is, is that there is something truly special in the way that, that this iteration of The Christmas Carol really comes out. The movie is structured in such a way that majority of it deals with the kindness, patience, and goodwill of the main character. He believes in his community. He believes in his family. He sees good in everybody. And things out of his control happen where it just gets worse and worse and worse. That's what more the film is about. It, it focuses a lot more on this journey that George has to go through in, in, in desperate times of financial difficulty, in swindling by corrupt people. And every step of the way, he's like, no, I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to keep giving. I'm not going to give up until he gets to that point where he's like, I give up. And, and, and this is why I find the film so powerful. And I mean, look, it's made in 1946. Uh-huh. And yet it is so relevant today because it's very easy for us to... To, to find that despite all our struggles and things like that, that it's, it's easy enough to just give up. And what happens then is he is shown why he shouldn't give up. Of course, that's only part of it because where the film then concludes is that not only does it give him a new lease on life to see that a world without him is not right, then everything comes together at the end that vindicates that point of view. And that's particularly in the way that his family his friends, his colleagues, and his community rally round him to save the day. The real, the real hero in *That's Wonderful Life* is not George, but and it's and the real guardian angel is not Clarence; it's his wife. Oh. And you will see that in that story. It, the power that you know, and it's not about the power of a good 1950s wife at all. It's actually just the power of love oh. and what it can do. And that's why this film stands as one of the best Christmas movies because it captures everything you need to feel during Christmas. And now, number one. Billy Pelser has a nice home. Billy, is that you? Yeah, Ma, it's me. A nice job. A nice girl. If you're not doing anything this Thursday night, maybe you'd like to uh, go out on the date with me i'd love to and loving parents who are about to give him you're gonna like this no 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 don't shake it we're gonna have to open it now it won't wait till christmas the most unusual gift he ever got what is it it's your new pet 
Come on, Barney, be a good dog. My dad gave it to me. But there are a few things to keep in mind. If you expose it to the light, you may hurt it. If you get it wet, it will multiply. All that from water? They got wet? Yeah, plain water. And most important, no matter how much they beg, never, never let them eat after midnight. This is what Christmas is all about for me. Horrible little monsters running around causing trouble and destroying everything. Gremlins. Also oh, not children. No, not, not children. But gremlins. The same thing. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. There's, there's nothing I don't love about this film, man. This is such a fun, timeless story, dude. It just oozes everything I loved about Steven Spielberg growing up, even though Joe Dante directed it. I just love this movie so much, I named my dog after the Mogwai in it. What's your dog's name? Gizmo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've seen this movie so many times over the years, man. It just never gets old. You can't say that about a lot of movies, but you can say that about Gremlins. And for me, Gremlins is just the perfect Christmas movie. It captures the Christmas spirit while not being hokey, and it's always entertaining. Daniel? So you know how you um, haven't seen The Muppet Christmas Carol, and you haven't seen It's Wonderful Don't say Life? it. No, I've seen Gremlins. I thought, I, I Jesus, thought, my I thought God. I'd give you a heart attack because um, I have seen Gremlins. Um, it you better have. Interestingly, though, just because probably my age, um, Gremlins wasn't Gr- iconic. Gr- Gremlins came out on your birthday. Uh, well, it may have come yeah. out on my birthday. Yeah. But literally my birthday, right? Yeah. 1984. Mm-hmm. Because of my age, Gremlins never became iconic for me as a growing up person. It just it could also connect it to the, my upbringing that being the oldest in my family, um, watching the more, not violent movies, but the, the more adult-oriented movies, PG-13, was a bit of a f- struggle for me um, to, to be able to watch. And so being that it was a slightly older movie, um, I did not get to experience it until I was probably in my mid-20s. Um, so it never connected to me in the same way I know Gremlins connects with a lot of people. Um, but that's because I had other movies that do, to do that kind of sat in its place. When I first saw Gremlins, um, what I think I really loved about it was the sort of, despite it being a slight horror film, there was something really magical about it. Mm. Um, it was, uh, it was again, just another darker look at Christmas, but still embodied the same Christmas values that, um, were just, uh, involved in all my Christmas movie watching um, and viewing as I was growing up. And so I was able to relate to it in, in when I eventually got around to watch it. Uh-huh. Um, and I think it's a great movie and it just does deserve to be high up on your list. Yeah, that's right. Number and, one. And, and this decade, we're getting Gremlins free. We are? Sure. This you, decade for certain. You think so? Maybe next decade. By 2035, we will have Gremlins 3. Hiya, pal. Deck the halls with Marv and Harry. Yes. Make their Christmas not so merry. Give them bricks and give them wrenches. One more Christmas in the trenches. Toss some paint cans down to greet them. Send the toolbox down to meet them. Serve the nails for Christmas dinner. Kevin is declared the winner. May I do the thinking, please? Home Alone 2, lost in New York. So let's recap. Batman Returns. Yep. Long Kiss Goodnight. Yep. The Muppet Christmas Carol. Yep. It's a Wonderful Life. Yep. Home Alone 2. Lost in New York. Yep. This is a fucked up list. I worry about you, Dan. Thank you for directing my horror movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is why that... Um, this is why I believe maybe that I have a growing career as a horror filmmaker. Um, Christmas for me is an interesting time of year. 
also. But and then it, it, I will stick to my argument, as it is with Batman Returns and Long Kiss Goodnight, Muppets, Wonderful Life, and Home Alone 2. It comes down to family. And those, no matter who they are, like they can be messed up people, but they mean something to you and they give you some sort of joy in life. Now, Home Alone 2... All right, so when, 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 we, when we were working on this episode earlier um, and planning our movies together, I put out on Twitter, like, what, what, what will be our top five movies? And giving an opportunity for people to, yeah, to sort of guess what, what our top five is. There was only one person that got kind of close, and that is uh, a previous guest of ours and a good friend, Declan Shrub. Um, and he, he thought that potentially the top five would be Die Hard, which we've talked about, but is not in our top five. Mm-hmm. Love Actually, because he knows I'm a romantic, and Love Actually is in the top ten, but it's not in the top five. Um, Christmas Vacation, which he picked from you, which mm-hmm. was great. I still say he's a witch. He also said something from by Shane Black, which... Is every single movie Shane Black has ever made. So it was an easy guess, but uh, he also is very aware that when filmmakers talk about Christmas, they're going to talk about Shane Black, because it's just what filmmakers do. We love Shane Black for some reason. He also said that Home Alone would be my number one. Ah, uh-huh. you were wrong. Kind of. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, Home Alone is a great movie. You know, it's a great Christmas movie. But there is something about Lost in New York, and, and it's, not, it's not Donald Trump. Is it Tim Curry? Um, it's definitely got a lot to do with Tim Curry. Is it Rob Schneider? Uh, it's got a lot to do with Rob Schneider, but it's not in my top five. And there's a good reason for it, because in Home Alone, Kevin McAllister was stuck at home. Mm-hmm. Hence the title. Uh, hence the title. In Home Alone, his mission is basically to save his home, which is, is, is a high stakes sort of thing. I mean, protecting your home is a big deal. And I feel that, though, that the themes are a bit different in the first movie. The themes are more selfish in a way. It's about Kevin get, coming to terms with his place in his family. It's coming to terms with... Um, Not being a brat. Yeah, not being a, a sport child. He's got to learn to grow up. He's got to learn to accept, um, fi- you know, like he, yeah, he's got to find his place, which, you know, it's, it's a great Christmas kind of journey for any character in a Christmas movie. Worked for Scrooge. That's right. It's almost like a Scrooge story coming back to the Christmas Carol again. Oh my God, there's only one Christmas story, isn't there? It feels like it. But yeah. this, is, this is why I think Lost in New York is my favourite Christmas movie because it does one thing different that I think it stands out from the others. And that is, Kevin is completely selfless in this movie because what he does is that he saves Christmas for a whole bunch of orphan children. Right? His, his motivation isn't about self-preservation. It isn't about himself in that he has to, uh, you know, find a safe place to be at Christmas or, you know, he has to protect... Um, something that belongs to him. He ultimately cr- commits a crime to save a whole load of underprivileged children. And that completely just attaches to my heart, attaches to my, my emotions or Christmas and what I think Christmas should be about. I mean, he rejects the commercial side of Christmas. He doesn't, he doesn't need all these things you would expect you would want from Christmas. He embodies that meaning and he goes out to save the orphans. I mean, and as a film, it's quite funny because what it does is that he does all these selfless things, these amazingly selfless things where, he, I mean, you know, he's risking going to jail for assaulting and attacking two innocent robbers. <laughs> well, as innocent as they come, they're, they're just numbskulls. They're just doing the thing. They're just doing their thing. They're doing their job. But he does that to help save the kids. And, I, and by, by protecting... The, the profits of the toy store, he, he embodies what Christmas is about. However, to sort of bring the story together, I, f- I find it quite uh, entertaining that the filmmakers decided that to reward him at the end, the toy store gives him a whole load of presents. So it kind of undoes its own argument in some mm-hmm. ways. If he never got all those presents and he just got his family back at the end. Including Buzz. Including Buzz. You know, it would have probably stuck, but of course... For some reason, because it's America, they he got rewarded. He got rewarded for all his good deeds that he done. Which, yeah, okay, it do, does undo some of the um the messages that yeah are created through that. But I have to say, as somebody, as I started this episode talking about my relationship with 
my mother and I, I know Russell your relationship with your mother when she she was alive that it was special at Christmas mm-hmm. special every day too yeah and 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 I think why I put Lost in New York as my number one is due to that beautiful scene at the end when his mother tries to find where his son is in New York and she's asked where would your son be on Christmas Eve and he said well he would be around the Christmas tree enjoying the Christmas lights and everything that comes with that and she realizes that he's standing outside Rockefeller Center where the biggest Christmas tree in New York is kept and that moment where he's there and he's talking to the tree as if it was like Santa or something and and he's like I just you know regardless of everything all I want is my mum and there she was that's lovely and that's why Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, is your favourite Christmas movie. Yeah. All good things do come to an end. And here we are, 12 months later from when I first conceived this podcast, as a form of self-help therapy, navigating the perilous paths of independent filmmaking. We produce 10 mostly diverse podcasts, featuring many colleagues and friends who share their insights and journeys as content creators. I want to thank my co-host, Russell who has spent tireless hours editing down our recordings to create interesting and informative episodes. I was determined not to present a weekly rant where we sit behind a mic and talk untethered for hours upon hours, but in all honesty, our recordings weren't far from that at times, and so we have Russell to thank for keeping our episode durations to a respectful length. Listeners, please don't get me wrong. Film Rhapsody is not going anywhere, but we feel we've come to a natural end for our episodes in 2019. So. In our next and final episode of Season 1 of the Film Rhapsody Podcast, we have something really special to present to you. Written and directed by Russell Lee, we are proud to present Alice, the Radio Play, Part 1. The Alice feature film is literally moments away from taking over our lives, and we want you to love the film as much as we're currently loving producing it. So, from Russell and I, we wish you a very Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and look out for our season finale just before New Year's Eve. I'm Dan Sanguinetti, and you've been listening to Film Rhapsody. Film Rhapsody is produced by Dan Sanguinetti and Russell Lee for Sanguinetti Media. Head to sanguinettimedia.com.au to subscribe to all our episodes. Oh, I didn't record it.